So when we are working with multi-core systems, we have to deal with uh, three uh, main issues. One is cache coherency, the uh, second one is synchronization and the third one is memory consistency. So as part of the last week uh, lectures, we covered cache coherency problems and we also discussed uh, a three state cache coherency protocol to deal with cache coherency problem. And in this week, we are going to discuss synchronization as well as the memory consistency. And the material whatever I am going to cover for the synchronization and memory consistency is uh, taken from uh, the Parallel Computer Architectures book by uh, Kuller, Jaswinder Pal and Anup Gupta. So why do we have to worry about synchronization? So the synchronization ensures that the consistency among uh, shared data structures. When we are running uh, multi-threaded application on a multi-core system and uh, these multi-threads may uh, share uh, some set of uh, data structures and so on. So we have to ensure that uh, at any point of time, only one thread will access the critical section and uh, so no two processes should enter the critical section and for that we have to come up with a set of synchronization mechanisms. And also uh, in our multi-threaded uh, program execution, so maybe some threads are waiting for some event to be occurred and uh, some other thread is going to produce a result for that particular event. And again based on that event, so the other threads which are waiting for this event to occur can proceed further. And similarly, there may be a scenario where all the threads have to wait for some event to occur and then proceed further, then also again we need the synchronization mechanism. So effectively, so there are different type of synchronizations we have to consider. One is a mutual exclusion, the second one is point to point event synchronization and the third one is uh, the global event synchronization. And for the mutual exclusion, we generally use lock and unlock pairs. And for uh, point to point event synchronization, we use uh, flags. And finally, for uh, the global event synchronizations, we use barriers. So as part of this course, we concentrate on uh, uh, what are the hardware primitives we can support for uh, ensuring the synchronization mechanisms uh, in uh, multi-core systems. So we can actually uh, provide the hardware mechanisms as well as the software mechanisms for uh, uh, providing this synchronization, but uh, there are advantages and disadvantages with each of these things. So obviously, uh, with the hardware, we can get a better performance, but the lack of uh, flexibility, hardware mechanisms may not be useful in all scenarios. But whereas in the case of software, so uh, in the case of software, the performance may not be that much uh, significant, but uh, will have a greater flexibility and adaptability to the scenarios and so on. And also the cost wise, it will be uh, cheaper to implement uh, synchronization mechanisms in software. So we first start with the mutual exclusion. So here the mutual exclusion says that when uh, two processes are competing to enter into a critical section, only one process will be allowed to enter and the other process will be stopped from entering into the critical section. So for that we have to come up with uh, uh, locks and unlocks mechanisms either by using the hardware or by using the software. So in the Older systems typically the hardware locks were used uh, in terms of uh, lock lines and uh, so these lock lines are separate from the address and the data lines in our uh, processor and whenever any process wants to enter into a critical section, it sets the, uh, the lock line. Once the lock line is set, if any other process wants to enter into the same critical section, then it will just wait until this lock line will be reset. So as a result, like uh, we can prevent any other process entering into the critical section and the process which is in the critical section, whenever it wants to come out of the critical section, then it resets the lock line so that uh, one of the uh, processes which are waiting to enter into the critical section will set the lock line and then it will go to the critical section. So this is a simple method, but it is not uh, uh, scalable because uh, at any point of time, we can have a limited number of lock lines in our system. So as a result, uh, not more than uh, that many lock lines can be used and as a result, uh, uh, we cannot uh, implement this method for uh, uh, larger multi-core system where uh, large number of threads are there and they want to enter into a critical section, then we cannot apply uh, using this particular uh, mechanism. And uh, also we can uh, 
consider uh, lock locations in memory or lock registers in place of uh, lock lines. And in the case of software, we can come up with an algorithm uh, which is uh, a routine which is going to acquire a lock and then there is a routine which will uh, unlock this particular uh, thing. So, we can write a sequence of uh, instructions in our program and uh, so this set of instructions are going to acquire a lock and release the lock. And a simple example we can consider here is, uh, we can see here there is a load instruction, we are loading some data from a memory location to a register and we compare the register with the value 0, that means like whether the value stored in the location is 0 or not, we are going to check and if the value is not equal to 0, that indicates that uh, someone has already acquired the lock and then we have to again go back to this and then uh, execute this sequence of instructions. And whenever if the location uh, is storing the value 0, so as a result this condition will be false and uh, as a result we can uh, uh, just go to this store instruction and we store value 1 into that memory location and once we complete this then automatically we say that uh, lock is acquired and the process which acquired the lock can enter into the critical section and it executes uh, the sequence of instructions that are there in the critical section. And whenever it completes its execution then it can uh, reset the lock by using this uh, uh, storing a value 0 onto this memory location, so by using a store instruction. So that uh, any other process which is trying to enter into the critical section will see that now the lock, uh, the location has a value 0, so that it can uh, uh, acquire the lock and then proceed. So this is a simple uh, the piece of code written in software to uh, achieve lock and unlock pair for mutual exclusion. So, here the overall idea is, so there will be a lock variable stored in some memory location and we have to load that value onto a register and we have to check whether the variable has a value 0 or not. If it is 0 that indicates no one has acquired the lock, so that the process which loaded this value onto a register can acquire this lock and to say that this process has acquired the lock, it has to store a value 1 onto the memory location. So, that if any other process trying to enter into the critical section or trying to acquire the lock, we will see that the location has value 1 and it cannot proceed further because of this uh, loop here, because a branch not equal to 0 lock is there. So, the second process which tries to enter into the critical section will fail acquiring the lock, so it will be in this loop. And uh, once the process which has the lock and it wants to release the lock, then it stores a value 0 onto the location. So, though this is a simple code, actually there is a problem in this particular uh, piece of code. The problem is, so let us say process P1 is trying to acquire the lock. So, process P1 first loads the value from the memory location to a register, then it compares and when it compares, let us assume that the location has a value 0. So, as a result register has a value 0 and this compare statement is correct. So, as a result uh, this uh, condition will be false. So, it tries to go to this second instruction that is a store location 1. But assume that simultaneously another process P2 also trying to enter into the critical section and trying to acquire this lock. It also reads the value from this location to a corresponding register and it also checks the register whether the value in the register is 0 or not and it also finds that the value in the memory location is 0. So, as a result the register also has a value 0 and this condition is uh, uh, false. So, as a result it also goes for this uh, store instruction. So, now process P1 and process P2 both are uh, executing the store instruction and both are trying to go for store uh, location 1. So, they are trying to write value 1 into the memory location. Though this memory location is unique for both the things, but because uh, process P1 may write first and process P2 may write second and so on, but does not matter. By the time you come here, then automatically the process is going to acquire the lock. Because this load, compare and store, these three operations are independent operations. So, as a result, 
multiple processes can execute these instructions simultaneously and as a result multiple process can acquire the lock. So, as a result at the end both processes P1 and P2 are going to enter into the critical section and uh, that actually defeats the whole purpose of uh, having this particular routine because we want to ensure that only one process enters the critical section by using this code but actually this code is not actually doing that. That is mainly because so we are loading at once comparing second and then writing after that. So, because these three operations are independent operations and these are not performed atomically and as a result uh, we have this problem. So, that means we have to come up with an atomic operation to load the value from the memory location, to update the value and to compare the value and so on. So, we need a single instruction that performs all these three operations so that any process which is actually executing that atomic operation, atomic instruction will ensure that it will get the lock and uh, no other process will enter in the critical section. So, in order to do that we have to actually have atomic read modify write instructions in our uh, ISA. Again as I mentioned earlier we are going to deal with the hardware support to ensure the synchronization. So, as a result we have to look at what is the support we can get from the instruction set architecture uh, to achieve this uh, mutual exclusion or the synchronization mechanisms. So, as a result we need to have read modify write instructions in our ISA so that whatever the software routine we write for uh, acquiring the lock and releasing the lock they can use this hardware primitives or this atomic instruction supported by ISA and as a result uh, we can achieve mutual exclusion. So, we need hardware primitives such as test and set, swap, fetch and increment etcetera type of instructions in our ISA. Effectively the first step is we load the value from a memory location to a register, we modify the register content and finally we write this register content back to the uh, memory location because this memory location is actually holding this synchronization variable. So, as a result once we perform these three operations one after another in an atomic way, so there is no other process which is going to interfere with this and then uh, update and as a result we can prevent multiple processes entering into the critical section by preventing uh, multiple processes acquiring the same lock. So, we just consider a test and set uh, uh, instruction and uh, what are the sequence of steps that happen as part of this uh, atomic instruction. So, in the test and set we are going to load the value we test and we set it. So, first we will uh, the value in a memory location is read into a specified register in our processor and uh, the constant 1 is stored into the memory location automatically. While we are reading the value from the memory location to a register, we are also writing a value 1 to the memory location. So, these two will happen simultaneously. We say that this test and set operation is said to be successful only when we load the value 0 into our register. For example, if the value in the memory location is 1 that indicates that there is some other process which has already acquired this lock. So, as a result when we get value 1 from the memory location our test and set operation is uh, not successful for this particular process. So, whenever if any other process acquires the lock then the memory location is going to have a value 1. So, that if any other process subsequently trying to acquire the same lock then it reads a value 1 into its register and uh, as a result this test and set operation for this subsequent process is actually unsuccessful. And this can be applied for uh, uh, by considering any other values rather than just 0 and 1. But overall so this test and set instruction is going to load a value from a memory location to a register simultaneously it writes a value to the memory location and it checks whether the register content is 0 or not. If it is not 0 then the test and set instruction is said to be failed, if it is 0 then the test and set condition is said to be uh, true and as a result the corresponding process which executed this test and set instruction acquires the lock. So, we are testing and then setting 
both are happening simultaneously as a result this is called as an atomic instruction. Now, we will see how the previous code is modified by using this test and set and so that we actually acquire the lock and we prevent multiple processes entering into the critical section. So, our uh, previously we have a load instruction, compare instruction and a store instruction, three independent instructions, but now we have uh, only one instruction that is a test and set instruction and remember this test and set instruction is supported by our underlying ISA. So, we execute test and set, uh, here we are reading a value from location in a memory to a register at the same time we are setting the value in this location and now we are checking the register content whether the register content is 0 or not. If it is uh, not equal to 0 then we are actually going back to this and then we are trying to again acquire the lock and if it is uh, 0 then the lock is acquired so that this process is going to enter the critical section and it executes the instruction in the critical section and once it comes out of the critical section then it executes this unlock uh, the instructions. So, that will be like uh, it is going to store value 0 uh, into this memory location. So, that any other process which is actually waiting for this lock to be acquired now can uh, uh, succeed with this condition and then it can acquire the lock. So, this is a simple uh, uh, the instruction using which we can uh, ensure the mutual exclusion. So, similarly the various ISS have uh, the support for uh, different type of this atomic uh, instructions. One is a swap uh, instruction, the other one is a fetch and operation instruction, the third one is compare and swap. So, in the case of swap, we swap the values between a memory location and a register and uh, this swapping is going to happen simultaneously. Similarly, in the fetch and uh, the operation instruction, we will have a fetch and increment, fetch and decrement, fetch and add different type of instructions where we are going to fetch the value from a memory location and simultaneously we are going to perform an increment or a decrement or addition. Effectively, this increment, decrement or addition will be like modifying the content and finally, we store this value back to the memory location. All these things are going to happen simultaneously or uh, in an atomic sense. And in the case of compare and swap also again, uh, so here we require a memory location, a register to compare with and a register to swap with. We read a value from a memory location, we compare this value with some register content and if the condition is true then we are going to swap the contents of some other register with this memory location so that we acquire the lock. So again, so here typically this instruction requires uh, three operands and uh, our risk type of instructions are not actually supporting this three operand instructions and uh, as a result uh, we cannot use this compare and swap in uh, risk type ISAs. And also again if you see test and set, swap, fetch and operation or uh, compare and swap all these instructions are actually performed in atomic sense and also there are so many sequence of steps we have to do as part of executing this atomic instruction and that is actually going to take significant amount of time which is also going to increase our CPI clock cycles per instruction. And whenever we want to deal with risk type of ISAs and uh, the major advantage with the risk type of architecture is typically all the instructions are simple instructions and uh, so they are going to take less amount of time to execute and our pipeline stays time will be simple if you are dealing with the risk type of architectures. But now if you want to consider any of these atomic instructions in our risk type of architecture then that is going to put so much burden and as a result we have to look for some other alternative uh, type of uh, instructions uh, in risk type of ISS to deal with the mutual exclusion. So, these are uh, uh, different type of systems they are actually supporting uh, uh, different uh, atomic instructions in their systems. For example, IBM 370 uh, is considering compare and swap, x86 uh, ISS typically consider any memory instruction as an uh, atomic instruction with a prefix uh, before that instruction. A lock prefix will be considered so that any instruction with this lock uh, uh, prefix 
is said to be considered as an atomic instruction. And similarly, in the spark type of missions, we can consider a swap or compare and swap. And uh, but in the case of MIPS and the IBM power type of systems, so we actually consider non-atomic instructions, but we achieve this mutual exclusion. So that will be done by using a pair of instructions. Uh, they are called as a load locked and store conditional. Load locked are also called as a load linked. So we execute these instructions load locked and store conditional independently and if the second instruction is successful then we can say that uh, the corresponding process has acquired the lock. So in other words we actually execute these two instructions separately but we achieve the mutual exclusion that we are going to discuss in the coming file in detail. So this is actually uh, considered in uh, uh, MIPS processors and uh, this is called as a load locked or load linked and store conditional. These are two instructions put together constitutes this atomic uh, execution and uh, it achieves the locking. So this load lock is not the same as a conventional load instruction. So we are going to read a value from a memory location into a register and at the same time we are going to set some flag associated with this memory location that is called as a lock flag. So once we perform this then we say that the load lock is completed and after this we can perform arbitrary number of uh, instruction operations to modify this register value and again we are not immediately performing this store conditional. So store conditional can be performed after some time uh, after performing our load lock. So here once we perform this arbitrary instruction execution to modify this register value then we will go for the store conditional. But the store condition also again is not same as a conventional store instruction. The conventional store instruction is going to write some value to the memory location, but the store condition is going to be performed only when some condition is said to be true. So that is what here it is going to do. So store condition is going to write some data of a register to the memory location if and only if there is no other write to that particular location happened since this particular process has performed this load lock. So in this uh, the discussion, so we can uh, interchangeably consider process or processor. So now here consider a scenario where we have a two core system where processor P1 performed load log operation. So it reads a value from a memory location to its register and also it sets the corresponding log flag register in its uh, local cache. And after that the processor P1 tries to go for store conditional operation. Meanwhile let us say if processor P2 also performed the load lock operation on the same memory location and it reads the value from the location to its register and also it sets the lock flag register in its local cache. Now if processor P2 actually performed the store conditional before processor P1 is going to perform store conditional then automatically using this lock flag uh, mechanism processor P1 knows that there is some other write happened to the same memory location. So as a result it has to again go for the load lock instruction execution. So that is what it says here. So store conditional said to be performed only when there is no other processor which performs a write operation to the same memory location after this particular processor which performed its load lock. Because we are performing this load locked and store conditional not in an atomic sense, so there may be some other uh, processors which perform operations between this load lock and store conditional. So that we have to check and if no other processor performed any write operation to this memory location then we can go ahead with this store conditional and the corresponding processor is going to acquire the lock. And if SE is succeeded that indicates that there is no other intermediate write from any other processor to this memory location. So as a result semantically we achieved this atomic execution of read, modify, write. 
and if it fails then we have to again go back to the load lock and then we have to execute and also again the way it is implemented is that we actually set the location flag in our local cache and we always have to do is uh, we have to check this the flag and if the flag bit is a reset that indicates that some one else has already written uh, to that memory location and as a result uh, uh, we have to again uh, go ahead with this LL operation and we do not have to generate any invalidation signals. So, as a result this is a simple method and uh, we can perform this atomic uh, operation using non-atomic instructions and we acquire the lock if our store conditional succeeded. So, this is a piece of code uh, that uh, achieves locking and unlocking using this load lock and store conditional. So, we can see here we have LL instruction this is a load locked uh, or load linked instruction and it is going to read value from a memory location to a register R1 and at the same time it is also going to set the lock flag associated with this particular location in its local cache. And then it checks whether the location is already having a value 0 or not. If the value is 0 then it can proceed with modifying the contents of the register. If it is not 0 then that indicates that some other processor already acquired the log then it has to go back to this and again it has to read the value uh, from the memory location. And if it is successful in completing this LL operation and successful in completing this condition then it will go for the store conditional. Whenever it goes for store conditional again it checks whether the flag bit is reset or not. So, if there is a change in the flag bit then automatically store conditional is not set to be successful then again we have to go for uh, this lock. So, that is what we are doing here. So, store conditional location and R2. Here what we are doing is we are writing the contents of some other register to this location and at the same time we are checking the lock flag register or lock flag bit. If the bit is equal to 0 that means someone else reset this uh, lock flag bit then we have to again go back to this lock and then we have to start with LL again. And if it is not then automatically no one has written to this memory location. So, as a result we can uh, acquire the lock and we can enter the critical section. And whenever uh, the processor completes executing in the critical section then it is going to release the lock by writing value 0 to the location. This unlock is same as our previous uh, uh, the mechanism whatever we discussed earlier, but this locking mechanism is different rather than considering a test and set or swap or compare swap type of atomic instructions. Now, we are actually uh, performing these operations by using two independent instructions one is load lock the other one is store conditional. So, we will see with an example how uh, this lock flag mechanism is implemented. So, consider uh, a two processor system in our multi core and processor P1 is actually trying to acquire a lock on this memory location. Let us say this is a variable uh, which is stored at address x y z. Now, we want to acquire the lock on that particular variable. So, we read this value to our uh, uh, register in processor P 1 and we have a support of lock a flag bit as well as the lock address uh, register. So, we store this address into this lock address register and we set this lock flag uh, bit whenever we are performing this LL operation. If LL operation is successful then we are going to uh, store this address in the lock address register also we set this lock flag bit. Now, we will see if there is any other processor which is going to update this memory location if it is so then what is going to happen. Because anyway our multi core system has a support of cache coherency. Now, if any processor is trying to write to a location it has to send an invalidation signal on the bus which is connected to this processor. Again we are here assuming 
the invalidation based protocol. So, because invalidation based cache coherency protocol is implemented in this particular system, whenever we are going to write, uh, then we are going to send an invalidation signal for this particular address. So, all the cache controllers connected to this bus will snoop on the bus and they will check in their caches to see if whether they have the corresponding address uh, uh, location in them or not. If there is a match, then they have to invalidate. Because here the xyz is there and processor p1 actually storing this particular value in this lock address. So, it is going to invalidate and this will be indicated by this resetting this lock flag bit. Now, processor p1 again wants to uh, go for this store conditional because previously it executed uh, uh, the LL operation. Now, it is going to go for SC uh, to acquire the lock. When it goes for SC, SC operation is said to be unsuccessful because the lock flag bit is reset now. So, as a result again it has to go back to this LL operation and again it has to uh, perform this LL operation and then again it has to go for SC operation if it wants to acquire the lock. So, this is a whole set of uh, sequence of operations that happen whenever we are uh, performing uh, uh, locking mechanism using this LL and SC instructions. So, the whatever I have mentioned uh, previously is uh, represented uh, in this foil here. So, we require a lock flag as well as a lock address register of at each processor for each memory location on which we are going to acquire a lock. And uh, LL operation uh, sets the lock flag and puts the address of this memory location uh, into this uh, lock address register and uh, any incoming invalidations for the same address will invalidate uh, uh, this lock flag or by reset this lock flag. And uh, if there is no incoming invalidation signals for this particular address, then we can go ahead with SC operation and so that this processor is going to get the lock on that particular memory location and it can enter the critical section. So, here is not just the invalidation signals which will reset the lock flags, but the lock flag bit can also be reset under other scenarios uh, where. So, if the cache block which actually holds this the lock address uh, value is evicted from the cache, then also we are going to uh, the reset the lock flag uh, bit. So, that again the processor has to go for the LL operation. And similarly, whenever there is a context which happens, then we have to reset this lock flag. So, this is about uh, the mutual exclusion. Now, we are going to see the other one which is uh, the event synchronization mechanism. Here event synchronization can happen on a point to point basis or on a global sense. So, for the point to point event synchronizations, we are going to use uh, uh, the flag bits and for the global synchronization, we have to use the barriers. So, first we will uh, discuss this point to point event synchronization. So, here this point to point event synchronization can be implemented uh, by using software algorithms which are mainly classified into two groups. One is busy waiting, the other one is blocking. So, in the busy waiting typically, so all processes which are actually waiting for some event to happen will just execute in a loop, infinite loop and whenever the event happens then automatically the processes which are busy waiting on this event will come out of the busy wait and then they can proceed further. So, now here in this busy wait typically what happens is the processor cycles will be wasted because the corresponding process is actually busy waiting. So, in order to eliminate this wastage, we can actually go for the other type of mechanism that is blocking. So, here a process which checks whether event is occurred or not. If the event has not yet occurred, then it will block itself from execution. So, that this processor can be given for some other process and uh, whenever this event completes, then automatically it sends a signal. So, that all the processes which are blocking, they can now come for uh, the ready state and they can execute uh, further. So, here so the busy waiting is going to 
waste processor cycles, but if the busy waiting is not too much then automatically uh, it is not a good idea to go for blocking because the blocking is effectively a context which happens. So, there are trade offs the positives and negatives for both the things. And in the case of busy waiting typically we can consider uh, uh, some variables or flag variables or flag bits on which the process is going to uh, busy wait. And similarly, for the blocking we use the semaphore mechanisms and typically this semaphores and uh, uh, this busy waiting mechanisms and so on will be discussed in operating systems course. So, from the hardware point of view we can actually consider full and empty bit. So, using this full and empty bit we can achieve this uh, point to point event synchronization. For example, consider a producer and consumer uh, a scenario where producer is going to write a value to a register and a consumer is going to read the value from that register or the buffer. So, consumer cannot read the value from the buffer unless producer is producing the value to that particular buffer. So, that means, whenever producer produces a value to this buffer then it is going to set uh, the corresponding bit that is a full empty bit and the consumer always looks at this full empty bit. If the bit is set that indicates that the value that is there in the buffer is the valid value so that the consumer is going to consume it. If the bit is reset that indicates that the producer has not yet produced the value to this buffer so that the consumer has to just wait. So, that is what the whole idea. So, we set uh, when the word so set when the word is full with the newly produced data on a right and unset when the word is empty due to uh, a consumer process which is actually consume this particular data. So, this can be implemented at world level granularity or it can be implemented at uh, uh, bigger buffer level and so on. So, this can be used for uh, word level producer consumer synchronizations, producer writes consumer consumes and uh, this is synchronized by using this full and empty bit. So, effectively because of this full and empty bit we can ensure the atomicity of a, a read or a write with the manipulation of this bit because read cannot happen unless producer is writing the value to that location and setting the full and empty bit. Similarly, if the consumer is not consuming the value then it is not going to reset this full and empty bit. So, as a result producer is not going to produce a new value into this buffer location. So, as a result we can ensure that proper synchronization between producer and consumer just by using this full and empty bit. But again, so it is not providing enough flexibility unlike this software mechanisms. For example, consider a scenario where a single producer is there and multiple consumers. Now, when producer is producing the value it is going to set this full and empty bit, but now we have multiple consumers which uh, want to consume the value from this uh, buffer. Now, how do we reset? If you are going to reset after one consumer is consuming this value then immediately producer can produce a new value. So, that the other consumers they cannot uh, consume the previous value and so on. So, as a result it is not providing a flexibility uh, if you are going for the hardware mechanism. Now, finally, we consider uh, the barrier mechanism and these barriers also again we can implement either the hardware level or the software level. In the case of hardware level we can consider a wide and line which is separate from the address lines and the data lines. Let us say we have a four core system and we are going to uh, apply a barrier for this four core system where four threads are running on this four cores and uh, we have to ensure that all these threads have to come to a particular point and synchronize then they can proceed further to execute the remaining set of instructions. So, that means in order to achieve this we are going to put a barrier and uh, so even if three processors come to the barrier then they cannot proceed beyond this barrier unless the fourth one comes. 
So, it means when we have a barrier instruction in our uh, uh, piece of code, so none of the processors will proceed the barrier unless all the processors come to the barrier. So, this can be achieved by using this hardware mechanism by considering a wired and line and here this wired and line is initially having a value 0 and the value of this line will become 1 only when uh, all the inputs to this wired and line will be 1. So, now consider a scenario where we have 4 processors and only 1 comes to this uh, uh, the barrier signal. So, it is going to set the value 1, but because the other 3 processes have not come, so as a result their value will be 0. So, the resultant value on the wired and line will be 0. So, uh, the process which comes to this uh, the barrier signal will not proceed further and it waits for all the other 3 has to come. Now, let us say if all 4 have come, then everyone is going to send a value 1 onto the wired and line because this now 4 have come. So, the outcome on this void and line will be 1. So, as a result uh, they can proceed further. So, this is a simple method, but again it provides uh, uh, no flexibility. In other words, for example, if we have more number of cores, then we cannot actually scale up this design for uh, larger core count. And also another thing is uh, let us say if you are going to go for uh, uh, barrier signal for only fewer processors in our system, then also we cannot uh, use this particular mechanism. So, it is uh, difficult to support arbitrary subset of processors or uh, multiple processors per processor in our system and also it is difficult to change dynamically the number of processors which are actually involved in the barrier. For one piece of code, let us say for processors are involved in the barrier and for the second piece of code maybe like uh, 8 processors are going to involve in the, the barrier. So, we cannot adapt to these dynamic change in conditions if you are going for this hardware barrier mechanisms. So, we have to go for the software barrier mechanisms and that we are going to discuss now. So, in the case of software barriers, we can go for a centralized or decentralized software barriers, but we are going to discuss on the centralized barrier mechanism here. So, though we are actually going for software barriers, but internally we can take the help of uh, the hardware support in terms of hardware primitives to acquire the locks. So, this barrier can be implemented using locks, shared counters and the flags. So, in order to implement this, we will consider a simple piece of code where we have a, a structure variable for a barrier which consists of an integer counter and also it consists of a, a struct variable lock and also it has a flag bit. So, having defined this particular uh, barrier struct variable, now we will see how we can uh, go ahead with. Uh, the software barrier mechanisms. In this particular uh, barrier code, so what we are doing is first we acquire a lock on that particular barrier variable. So, we acquire a lock and this locking mechanism we already discussed previously uh, in the mutual exclusion mechanism. So, we acquire the lock so that there is no other processor uh, which is going to enter into this critical section. Let us say this is the critical section here, we are going to check whether the counter of this barrier variable is 0 or not and if it is so, then we are going to reset the flag associated with this particular barrier. Because we have to perform this in an atomic sense or in mutual exclusion sense, so we are actually acquiring a lock on this particular barrier variable. So, that we prevent all other processes to enter into the critical section to check and update these values by using this lock. So, we acquired the lock and uh, we check the condition and if the condition is true that means, this particular processor is the first processor to come to the barrier then immediately it is going to uh, reset the flag bit. And also it reads, it increments this uh, counter and it reads the value 
into its local variable my count. So now my count will be 1 and after this it is going to release the lock so that second processor again tries to enter the, uh, the critical section by performing these operations. So second processor will come and it acquires the lock and it checks whether the uh, counter is equal to 0 or not. Now because already processor P1 incremented the counter, so this condition will be false. So the second processor is not going to uh, reset the flag bit but the second processor is going to increment this counter and now the counter value is 2 and it is going to get the counter value 2 into its location and it also releases the lock so that the third processor can uh, uh, go to the critical section and uh, increment the counter and so on. Now after releasing the lock, now each of these processors is going to execute the remaining piece of code. So, they just check whether my count is equal to P or not, where P is the total number of processors involved in uh, uh, this particular barrier. So, if the count is equal to P that indicates that this particular processor is the last processor to reach the barrier and uh, so as a result it has to reset the counter and also uh, it has to set the flag bit. If any of these processors is not the last processor to enter the critical, uh, not the last processor to reach the barrier, then this condition will be false and they will go to this else and uh, in the else part there is an infinite loop. They are just waiting for this flag bit to be 1. If the flag bit is 0, then they will be in the infinite loop. Whenever the flag bit is 1, then they will come out of this uh, busy wait loop and uh, so that they can proceed with all the instructions which are uh, subsequent to this barrier instruction in the code. So by looking at this code, we feel like this is going to achieve the global synchronization. But actually there is a problem with this particular piece of code. So the problem is, let us say we have four processors in our system and all these four processors are involved with this barrier. Let us say processor P1 comes to the barrier first, so the counter value is 0, so it is going to reset the flag bit and uh, its count is equal to 1 and it releases the lock and uh, uh, this condition is false, so it will be in this while loop because the flag is equal to 0, it will be in the while loop. Next processor 2 comes and it also acquires the lock and uh, counter is not equal to 0 now, so it is not going to execute this but it increments the counter value and now its count is equal to 2 and now it releases the lock and uh, this condition will be false and it will be again uh, in the while loop uh, waiting for this flag bit to be 1. Third processor also uh, comes here, acquires the lock and then uh, increments the counter and its count value is 3 now releases the lock and this condition again is false, so it will be in the while loop waiting for flag bit to be 1. Now fourth processor came and uh, it also acquires the lock and increments the count, now the count is equal to 4, it releases the lock and now the count is equal to 4, so as a result this condition is true and now it is going to reset the counter value and it sets the flag bit. So now the flag bit is set. So as a result, all the processors which are actually busy waiting for this flag bit to be 1 will see that this while condition is false. So as a result, they can now go ahead with the instruction subsequent to uh, this uh, barrier instruction. The main problem is here we are actually using the same flag bit where it is uh, all the processors are actually looking at this flag bit to be uh, set to 1 and if any of the processors is not seen the moment when the flag bit is set to 1, then we are going to have a problem and in order to eliminate this problem, we have to go for another mechanism that is called as uh, uh, the sense reversal mechanism. So because with the previous one, now one processor is waiting at the previous barrier and all the other three processes are waiting at the second instance of the same barrier. So that none of these four 
processors will proceed further and uh, as a result we will have a deadlock scenario. So, in order to eliminate this problem we have to go for uh, a modified version of this uh, mechanism by using the sense reversal concept. So, here what we actually do is we wait for the flag to take a different values on consecutive times because the previous problem happened mainly because the same set of processors are actually going to take the same barrier second time and when these processors are going to uh, go for the same barrier next time if we change the flag value or in other words if we change the condition on which they are actually waiting in the second instance then we can eliminate the problem. So, that we have done here see here for example, we are actually uh, changing this while condition previously we consider while flag is equal to 0 there is an infinite loop, but here we are considering while barrier name flag is not equal to the local sense then there is an infinite loop. So, now the code is the first processor comes to the, the barrier and uh, it executes this piece of uh, code first it changes it is a local sense previously whatever the local sense value let us say if it is 0 now it is going to consider the local sense is equal to 1 by using this uh, the negation operation. So, it is now going to get a value which is exactly opposite to whatever the value we considered in the earlier invocation of this barrier. For example, if the same processor previously uh, entered the barrier uh, with a local sense value equal to 0, now it is going to consider local sense value equal to 1. Now, it acquires the lock on the barrier variable and now it increments the counter value it is similar to the previous code whatever we have discussed in the previous file and whether this processor is the last processor to reach the barrier or not and if it is so then it is going to release the lock and after releasing the lock it is going to execute the remaining piece of code that is like uh, it is going to reset the counter and also it is going to uh, set the flag as the value whatever it has in its local sense variable. If this processor is not the last processor to reach the barrier then it will go for the else part and here it releases the lock and again uh, because this is not the last processor to reach the barrier. So, it will just wait infinitely here uh, for this condition to be false. So, here the condition is uh, the barrier name flag is not equal to the local sense. Since this particular processor updated the barrier name flag is equal to local sense. So, as a result now if this value is different then it will be in the infinite loop. If it is same then it will exit from that and then uh, uh, it can uh, proceed further uh, to the instructions which are following the, the barrier. So, now here consider again the, the previous problem scenario where 4 processors are there 3 processors reach the the barrier and when the fourth processor comes to the barrier now it uh, gets this if condition true. So, it releases the lock and then this last processor is going to uh, set the barrier flag as its local sense value and if any of the three processors which are actually waiting uh, by executing this while loop is actually context switch then there would not be any problem because when it comes back because it is actually waiting for this particular condition and uh, each has a different uh, local sense value and they are actually waiting on that corresponding local sense. So, that is not going to create a problem whatever we discussed earlier. So, this is about uh, the synchronization mechanism that is uh, implemented in uh, the multi core systems or multi processor systems. So, with that I am concluding this module and in the next module I am going to discuss uh, the memory consistency issues. Thank you.